So the show at the country club was 1983. And uh, since then, Yngwie quit Steeler and joined Alcatraz and then had his own band by this time, 1985, I think it was. And uh, 1984, 85, I get really confused on those dates of the years, but... uh, I'd get, been kicked out of Wild Dogs, and they begged me to jo- rejoin for uh, the summer or whatever. And one of the gigs that we did was, uh, I said, look, I'll, I'll do it, but uh, what's the gig? It's Yngwie. So I tried to stay cool. Rent me a car, and I'll do the gig. <laughs> I would have fucking paid to do that. But uh, so we, we go to Sacramento, and it's Talis with Billy Sheehan and Rising Forest with Andres and Jens and... Um, Maurice, I think. Uh, I went swimming with that guy. So we, we pull around the corner, and I see this beat-up old tour bus, and I said, you know, I have a feeling that's the bus I want to walk on and say hello in there. So I did, and it was Ingve's bus, and he was in there with the band, and um, I said, hi, it's, it's Matt. I used to talk to you when you answered the phone at Mike Varney's house a long time. Oh, yeah. And with Wild Dogs, we're, uh, we're on the bill here. With Dean Casanova on drone, oh yeah, and we talked about uh, stuff, and he said, "Where are you staying?" And I said, "Well, we don't have a place. Why don't you just stay at our hotel?" And <laughs> not in their room, but he was going to get me a deal. So he got me a great, great bargain on this deluxe room with a pool right outside your sliding glass door. And it was amazing, and uh, so we check in, go swimming, went to the sound check. And Yngwie's sound checks are like three hours long or more, depending on whatever. And they played pretty much the whole Made in Japan Deep Purple album with no vocals. Jeff Soto was the singer in that time, and uh, oh, he's played heart. And we got a, my wife was with me, my ex wife Angie, we got a short case of uh, Henry Weinard's Ale. We drank the whole thing watching the sound check. It was just great, man. It was better than the concert. And, um, uh, because Jens Johansson, the keyboard player, and he will trade off. And it was like, whoa. <laughs> I was just blown away. I was in my musical heaven. It was that day and the Lemmy, first time I saw Lemmy and shot Motorhead, the interview and all that, those are probably two of my favorite days in music ever. And uh, so it comes <laughs> time for Talos to do their, show, their sound check. And <laughs> they're running out of time, man. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> they told us we'll pay you not to play I said we're that bad <laughs> it's like no there's no room on the stage and we don't have time to do a sound check I go no oh, let's look we can do this we'll set up front row and we'll set up well, not the drums behind us we'll set up in a row in a line like that's uh, Night Ranger did that and you know Dean up in front was great anyway so we set up had a quick sound check line check and then uh, took off for our dinner which I think was spaghetti or pizza or something. Jeff Scott Soto offered me the singing job in Rising Forest right then. Said, "Look, you only have to. I can't. I can't sing like you. I'm more like a you know a clown up there, a cheerleader in a funny suit, and uh, <laughs> I can't sing. And uh, he goes, you only have to sing four or five songs, and then and it's so quiet, uh, nobody will hear you anyway.' I said, "No, man, you do the gig. I'm, I'm not worthy." Uh, I will be in a couple of years or something. And uh, so we do the gig, and then well, we were talking to all these people, the people that I hooked up with later on from MySpace who remembered me and, um, well, what's her name? I, I can't remember her real name because she's got a weird, funny name on uh, Lilac Hunter. <laughs> anyway, uh, she was out there, and all these Sacramento people, and I uh, got a skull ring, so we're out there hanging out, and it was time for us to uh, go do the show. We did the show and uh, got done. And the manager guy, who was the manager at the time of Wild Dogs, uh, he worked with Journey and their lighting company, wanted to have a meeting while Ingve was on stage. It's like, are you fucking crazy? No, I'm not going to have a meeting with you guys. And uh, it's probably good because I figured they were going to tell me, I wasn't long for the, the band again, so <laughs> it worked out in my favor. I had a good night and didn't get my, you know, hopes and dreams crushed by the fragile wild dogs. And um, Anyway, so 
So they're going to have a meeting with the manager during Ingve's set because none of my bandmates liked him, and Jeff, the guitar player, really didn't like him. He was really jealous because, you know, Jeff is like the guy for a minute with Varney, and then, then Paul Gilbert and Ingve show up. So uh, I said, no, you guys go have your little meeting because nothing ever gets said. It's a little bunch of crap anyway. Yeah. And I went back in and found a seat and watched the show, and it was amazing. Amazing is the word of the night. It was awesome. And, uh, you know, Ingve is just on his own, peeking out. The whole thing was great. And, uh, well, the show gets done. I go backstage or something, and I say, hey, man, that was awesome. And he goes, come on, let's go back to the hotel. So I, because you know, we're staying at the same place. The other guys are staying in some flea bag with ripped shower curtains for for more money <laughs> so I go to my ho- the hotel and uh, riding up in the elevator with Ingve and he goes do you have a screwdriver I go <laughs> as a matter of fact I do have a screwdriver I reached in my pocket I, which, uh, what size and uh, their manager Andy I think it was Andy Truman or something he gave me his number he said whenever we're in your town call me and uh, so I, I kept the number and we went uh, Ingve's room and he took apart his guitar again and uh, <laughs> I don't remember much after that but uh, <laughs> it was great Yeah, I had such a great time and you know I, it, I've seen everything from the Beatles and on for, at age four that uh, it takes a lot to really wow me and Ingve really wowed me every time I've seen him it's only gotten better and um, then he came to Portland and uh, I'd been managing this place called The Villa, which is a song about that in the Dr. Mastermind album. And it was over in the ghetto part of town, which wasn't very far from the Memorial Coliseum where the show was with Dio. So I went over, and I called up and went over, and as he came out of the bathroom with no guitar, and, hi, I have anything you want, man. And there was food everywhere. There was huge spread, food and booze, and I think even... Shoved a couple of half gallons, what was left of it, in my hand. Said, "Take it home, okay." And uh, Wally, Wally Voss, I think it was. He just joined the band. They found him in a music store. He told me the story. Said he was in a music store, and he said, "Well, we need a bass player." And uh, what, are you, what are you doing for a year? And <laughs> uh, he he did an album on uh, Shrapnel also. So uh, it was a great time backstage. In fact, I never went out and saw Dio and. Uh, it was a time when they had the big dragon and there was no pyrotechnics allowed in Portland. So <laughs> we're our lasers. And so this, the fire breathing dragon that uh, shot lasers and flash pots blew up, they couldn't do that. But uh, I was having more fun backstage with Ingve and the guys. And that was great, man. <laughs> Ingve came to town to play the Starry Night many times. And I'll do that in the next one.